Good evening and welcome everybody. We've done a sound check and hopefully um, the sound did not uh, readjust by itself. So uh, this is the this should be the proper uh, sound level for the evening and uh, we'll get started right away. All right, so uh, we've got a, a very interesting uh, market segment and then tonight um, based on what we were planning on doing was uh, looking at uh, specific stock sectors and uh, outlook for the next, well, we, we were looking at approximately 39 trading days to the year. Uh, that was when we first sent out an email invita invitation at the beginning of the week. And as you <laughs> probably are well aware, uh, we have now um, probably, what do we got, 50, 25, 30, 32, 35 days left now, something like that. 35 trading days. I, I'm not sure if you want to count the day after Thanksgiving as a, it's not a full trading day. I counted it because, you know, Black Friday, the markets were always open um, the day after Thanksgiving. It, and we, we, it'd be a, typically a half a day. So um, in any event, very few days left to the year for trading. And if you haven't made uh, your year has been uneventful, if you haven't had good performance, um, you know, it's, it's, I think you got some good trading opportunities. What I wanted to focus in on tonight was some of the commodity markets, such as gold, crude oil, uh, because those have a very strong interest with a lot of you. Um, and in addition to that, a lot of stocks to go through some of the names in the sectors that we would see some trading opportunities and also cover uh, a seasonal event that's coming up towards the end of the year. Now we got 35, let's call it and round up and say 35 trading days left to plan for the year. Um, we know we're coming into the holidays. So what holidays markets would we be looking at? And after earnings have been out, this, this has been an incredible earnings session um, because we've seen stocks, uh, you know, with, with where options were pricing in, um, you know, moves which were anywhere from four to six percent, and we saw either the under or the over on a percentage, and then trying to guess whether the market would gap higher or gap lower. So it was been a pretty interesting uh, earning season. Uh, whole food market uh, was one, and so we've had some pretty pretty big uh, moves in the market. I was surprised to see price line today um, with. A, and I know that uh, many of you probably, and, and this might be an important question, how many people are actually trading, uh, how many people just put in a Y for, for uh, stock trading? How many people are trading stocks right now? I'm not going to do the official, um, uh, the official um, poll. Uh, I don't want to interrupt the recordings. So we have a lot of folks, almost everyone here is trading, okay, a lot. Options, stocks or stock options, yes. So, I mean, because, you, you know, I consider uh, if you're trading options on stocks, it's the same thing. You're trading an option on a stock because you could trade long stock or short stock and, and get in a stock replacement strategy. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of you guys are, are trading that. I mean, we do a lot of that around here ourselves. And in, in fact, um, I think... Uh, Many of you are probably familiar with, uh, you know, the message that we've been giving out for uh, quite a number of, uh, at least two weeks now, and I uh, certainly up in in uh, Toronto, where uh, over ten, I, I, we had, were talking about the potential for the sector rotational correction in the market, looking for the lofty Nasdaq to kind of correct, and we got that today. We finally broke that magical 3360. We're going to cover that uh, in tonight's session. So. Um, here we go. Um, Priceline, what I wanted to finish my thought was Priceline, I mean, here we uh, ended the session um, in uh, at approximately uh, 1,021, and, and I think it's trading, uh, you know, um, down slightly, uh, 10 bucks lower than that. It did have an initial wild reaction, but, you know, here's one that, you know, I would have anticipated if anything, that's the one that you would have anticipated to see some type of a, a stronger move, a, a four, five percent, six percent type of move. Maybe we'll get it tomorrow morning on the opening. Um, but I think everyone was really focused on uh, the IPO of Twitter. So today was a very 
um, today was a very uh, important day. We had uh, a lot of things coming out. So, uh, you know, going forward, what are we going to do for the rest of the year? And uh, what areas are we going to be looking at? And, of course, we've got to come up with some trading ideas, and we've got to come up with a strategy. And then execution is important. And then trade management, how do we manage the trade? So we move stops, take half off. I mean, I think a, a great style is to... Um, especially as we're, we've been in a very volatile area. One thing that we've been doing, um, and, and part of our um, business model here at Persons Planet, is many of you know we have Trading Triggers University. We have a trading room, which we incorporate um, day trading in the markets as well as uh, we do planning and scanning every Monday morning. Then we have, uh, of course, uh, a commodity newsletter and a stock newsletter with PA Stock Alerts. And some of you probably receive uh, or are familiar with my partner at PA Stock Alerts. His name's Tom Asprey. Tom, uh, actually, he's probably one of the most famous uh, technicians no one really knows about. Uh, in fact, if you get a copy of Stock and Commodity Magazine, how many people get Stock and Commodity Magazine? Sure. Candace, if you read this month, uh, Roy, um, if you guys get uh, this month's, Jerome, okay, great. Read this month's Stock and Commodity Magazine, November issue, and in there is an article on, um, I, I don't remember what the exact article was about on, on moving average convergence divergence, MACD, right? And in there it mentions uh, the, the author of this uh, article, mentions uh, Tom Asprey, my partner at PA Stock Alerts, uh, for writing an article back, and I think it was 1988, on MACD. Actually, Tom is the one who created the histogram for MACD. So if anyone uses MACD and you use the histogram component, Tom created that. And Tom and I do PA stock alerts. And what we do is we look for trading ideas. We look for strategy and the execution. The reason I went into a long-winded uh, way of saying that is execution is important because... I think staggering orders on entries can be important, especially in an environment like this. Are we going to get a deeper correction? I'm going to go through that. I'm going to show you some technical analysis tools and sh show uh, you guys where we are with the market um, and do kind of like a quick review because today was a very important day. We had a big turnaround in the market. So the question begs, is this the um, pullback to be buying or is this the pullback to Katie bar the door and, and start uh, getting short as the big kahuna crash is coming. Those are, those are what we're going to uh, uncover tonight. All right? uh, I'll just cut to the chase. I don't think right now, the way the market's setting up right now, I don't think it's Katie bar the door, get ready for the biggest crash of the, the, the millennium. I don't see that. So um, anyway, Candace, yes, you could read the article. They just mentioned Tom's name and the article that he wrote on uh, back uh, in 1988. So Tom and I worked together. Uh, I think between Tom and myself, we have combined over trading, I think close to, I think we officially tally it at like 65 years, but it's probably 70 years, so, um, you know, we're both antiquated. But the, the key is, I think, experience, and we're all going, and I don't care who you are, uh, none of us have lived through this type of trading environment between the electronic high-frequency trading um, you know, the Washington government uh, inefficiency as it is, we still have to deal with that. So execution is very important, and I think getting into um, trading, and we all have to find the right trades that, that, that fit our personality. Um, some of you like options, and yet, you know, the, you have to go through a, a lot of different matrix uh, analytics studies, implied volatility, for example, time duration, theta. There's different... Uh, components to understanding what you're going to do with an option strategy. Understanding is implied volatility high relative to historic volatility. If so, high volatility is more uh, of an option writing strategy. Low implied volatility is more of a buying option strategy. And many of you, if you're aware, um, we've put out a lot of uh, tweets and what we do uh, in the trading room, general ideas. And uh, today I did cover half my position uh, we had um, uh, debit put spreads, 83, 81 in the queues that we put on uh, over the course of the last two weeks, uh, mainly because of the implied volatility 
and it just gave a better opportunity. We selected the cues because of the fact that um, it was the one that had the appearance that would have a, a deeper correction. We finally are seeing that right now. But again, options versus stocks, there's two different components. And you know, got to come up with some trading ideas and you got to have a strategy and then execution. Do you go all in? Do you stagger your orders? One of my techniques in execution, and we teach this in our class, folks, and I think this is something that you may find beneficial. If you're a, a swing or a position trader, right, and, and if you're looking at the charts, you guys probably see where the market opens and then you see where the market closes. And there's a famous uh, phrase, it's not important as, as important to how the market opens as it is how the market closes, right? So think of that concept, the open and the close. And then you get the high and the low, which causes a range, but really it's the open and the close. So if you're a, a, a trading, a swing trader, uh, trading positions overnight or, or trading maybe for multiple time periods or a couple weeks, think of this. If you're, if you're looking at a strategy and you have a trading idea, how do you execute getting into the position? Well, partly one of the things that we do in, in trying to, to get the best possible average price, not the best price, but to get a, the best possible position off, is you can look at, for swing and position traders, put positions on at the beginning of the week and then wait towards the end of the week to see how the market's closing if it's going in your favor, um, you know, and then you can kind of average in on your execution. And so you get in at the beginning of the week, you get in at the end of the week for more position uh, traders. Um, day traders are oh, holding positions overnight there's other techniques that you can use as far as execution. So it's not just price, it's also time, time components. So execution, is a, it's a very important, integral part of getting into a trade. And of course, trade management. With stocks, one of our favorite techniques, and, and, and I think it's very important, is because we don't know when this thing's going to turn. We've had pretty much a very exciting year in the market. It's been just, I mean, I think, if everyone, if I could teach anything to anyone in hindsight, I'd say, turn the damn news off. If you listen to the news during the day, you will probably be jumping out the first floor window um, because it's just been, it's horrendous. They just always are, are pounding the bad news. They're focusing on the bad news. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. And I think it's, it causes the fear, the skepticism. It, 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 it creates, it hinders you from maybe acting on the market. There's got to be, uh, I think, a way that when you have a trading idea, not to be influenced by outside input. And the news, the media, the business uh, channels uh, are very uh, rampant about projecting bad news this year. You've got to admit that, right? So uh, again, managing the trade is very important. And I think once you're in the trade, that's why uh, taking half off, for example, and then trailing stops is very important. And then the last key component for, for successful trading has got to be position sizing. There's an old adage, whenever you're right, you're always in one. Whenever you're wrong, you're always in 100. And, and I think that position sizing is a great formula that we like to, to use, and many of you are already aware of it. And, and that is by looking at the position size as a, in, in accordance to the um, the risk. So you could divide what the risk is to what your percent on your overall account would be per trade. So if you're risking 2% of your account on any one given trade, well, if you're trading stocks, then just divide the, um, the, the amount of money versus what the, the stop loss level would be, and then you can come up with the amount of shares that you can be in. So position sizing is, is very important. So Trend following, you got to just, you know, it's hard to do, but you keep it simple. Um, I guess a life philosophy is you always let the, the winners run and you cut the losers. It's a lot easier uh, said than done. So you've got to be able to say, okay, if I got a stop in the market and they stop me out, so be it. Typically trading with stocks in this year um, and going forward, because you're going to see this going into January now. We're going to do the whole thing over again in January. It's just not that long a time period away. Um, you know, if, you, if you're in a stock trade or if you're in a position before earnings, you know, it may behoove you to pay attention to those earnings because I think we're going to have the same, if not more, type of volatility of opens 
um, on a lot of the stocks in the next earnings season, if not maybe even more so. And the reason I say that is because of the pricing of the market right now, number one, and number two, some of the information I'll share with you in tonight's session. Um, but also, don't forget, we've got to the same government uh, uh, deal going on in January, the deadline's there for the budget deficit, and it's the beginning of the new year where we're going to have new pension fund money coming in, and it's just the new season. So, um, you know, some of the things, it the discipline aspect requires, um, you know, as I just kind of mentioned that, that news event, you know, listening to the news of maybe a report's coming out, being aware that reports are coming out, being aware that earnings are coming out is a lot different than listening to the news, trying to capture some insight from an analyst on TV when the anchor people are just, oh, this is horrible, oh, this is great, oh, the market's making new highs, there's never going to be any correction. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that discipline requires you guys to kind of be focused and going with the flow. Watch seasonal trends and technical analysis, by all means, I have to say helps. Um, good traders, we anticipate needs and trends of the marketplace. Uh, that, I think, is very important, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Let's anticipate the needs and the trend of the marketplace. So we know we got the holidays coming up, but we also know we have the end of the year, and every one of you, at the end of this year, you're either you're going to get a, a tax credit or liability statement, right, and your trades. But more importantly, there is going to be a uh, one thing I've talked about, and I just wanted to remind you guys, if you're not familiar with this, there's going to be a lot of stocks that, you know, certain stocks that are already negative or close to unchanged on the year or maybe well off their highs, their 52-week highs. If they're well off their highs at the low end of the range, and I'll give you a number. Let's say they're 10% off their lows for the year, and they're, they're near unchanged to negative of the year. Uh, blue chip, good fundamental uh, companies with good EPS, um, but yet they, they are being beaten down. They will probably be still beaten down going into the year's end because a lot of traders will be selling the dogs, the losers, and the reason to take a tax credit. So we've been talking about that. We've done this for a few years in our trading room. We had uh, a bunch of list of names. I mean, I think we did Sears two years in a row. It was, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, Herbalife before you know the media really blew that up this year. Herbalife last year was a, a classic example, and it was part of our list that we had. And some of you who are in our trading room know that we gave that list out, uh, and we're going to have that same situation this year. So, despite what the market's going to do right now, and and I'm going to get through this slide, and we're going to get right into some technical analysis and look at some some information that you can you know sink your teeth into. Um, but I think anticipating the needs and the trends of the marketplace, the trend that or the seasonal aspect that people will be selling stock for tax credit purposes to defer some of their capital, their gains that they've had this year, that is a, a, a trend of the marketplace that will occur. It's up to us to look for some of those trading opportunities because either what you want to do is towards the year's end, pay attention and follow some and look for these stocks and scan for some of these stocks because they may be presenting some of the best buying opportunities for the first quarter going into 2014. So that is an event that we want to kind of focus in on. Also, we have seasonal aspects of the market. Copper prices, which tend to stay weak in um, November, they turn around in December. Um, also, we're going to be looking at, if I've mentioned uh, crude oil, and the other one is gold. I mean, gold, by gosh, how many people are surprised that with the big decline today in the stock market, how many people are surprised that gold didn't have a, an amazing 30 or $40 move to the upside, right? I mean, if, if six months ago the stock market sold off, that would have been good for gold to be up at least 40 to $50, right? that inner market relationship. And today's action, we didn't see that. We saw a weakening in gold prices. So there, that's, that's something that I think um, we've got to a see a tide of change in some of the market uh, analytics that we need to kind of focus in on. Uh, we could be seeing a bigger downside move in gold over the course of the next 
week to 10 days. So we're going to kind of focus in on that a little bit. All right. So uh, we need to be kind of a student of the market. Uh, knowledge and it equals that, that confidence to act on a trade. And you can't be afraid to be wrong. That's what knowing what your risks is. I mean, I think the, the element of being successful and making money is saying, listen, I don't know more than the market. I don't know any more than any one of you. Now, this is a bold statement. I don't know any more than anyone in this room where the market is going to end up two weeks from now. I have no clue. You guys pro have an equal chance of being right as I do right now with that answer. Okay? So what we need to do is follow, and what we need to do is put on a trade with confidence knowing that our methodology is sound, number one, and that we can afford the risk that we've put down as part of your business plan. So we also need to act, not react to market conditions. Acting is saying, okay, I have analysis that says perhaps we're going to see a turn in the NASDAQ. We're starting to see a turn in the small caps. We're starting to see a turn, and it's evident not just by prices, but some of the market internals, uh, volume conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the best strategy that I'm going to put on, and now I have to wait to see if this works out. So that is acting, not reacting, and then all of a sudden as the market's crashing today saying, hey, I got to get short, I got to buy some puts. You know, that's not the way to do it, right? So the trader that generally gets in trouble, he's the one or she's the one that hesitates. Um, they wait and they're not prepared. So yes, while I might be real early with 35 trading days left to the end of the year in presenting some of this information to you guys, I think it's something that you, it gives you a chance to study, take notes, um, kind of sink your teeth into, and, and, and look forward to more information as, as we move uh, forward this um, coming, I think, I guess you want to call it month and a half. So one of the things that we look at is seasonal analysis, health and breadth analysis. Uh, when we're looking at the equity market, seasonal analysis, it, it, as many of you know, you've, you've been coming around, you've been seeing... Uh, my information and some of you guys are, are dear friends at this point. I know uh, I got who who we got here. Repeat offenders like Al Gaskell here. Um, where's Arthur? Arthur's here. I haven't seen Arthur in a while. Um, I mean, just a bunch of really wonderful people. Uh, Andy and it take me 20 minutes to read this whole list of people. So I'll just keep going. Um, one of the volume indicators that I've been teaching and sharing with people is instead of looking at volume histogram bars is to be looking at the trend of the volume using on balance volume indicator. Um, looking at futures related products, you can look at the uh, uh, open interest and uh, looking at some of the breadth of the stock indexes where uh, it's applicable. And I'd like to just switch over to that right now and then take a, a, a look with you live based on today's price action and, and share with you if you're interested in stocks, if you're interested in, in the market's direction and the health of the market, we're going to take a look here at my screen. These, this is my charts from Genesis um, Trade Navigator package. Now up here you have the uh, S&P 500. Here we have the NASDAQ uh, 100 right here. S&P is right there. This is the IWM, which is the uh, ETF for the Russell 2000. This is the NYSE, New York Stock Exchange Composite Index. And this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the diamonds. All right. Now, if we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop up each chart because the top row represents daily charts. The bottom row represents the same charts, but on a weekly basis. All right. So let me, let me just pop this up here real quick and say, okay, what technical damage did we do today in the stock market? Uh, first off, we generated finally a daily sell signal in the market. Already you can tell that the stock market, the, the S&Ps are up a little bit today. Um, looking at the advanced decline levels, we, as you can see here, we're going to have to, tomorrow's an important day. We've got the monthly unemployment report. But from this day to this day, we have a lower close in price, but we do not have a lower reading in advanced decline, number one. So for me, that says that perhaps this market is not truly as dire of uh, bearishness in the S&Ps as the charts would 
um, suggest, number one, looking at the NASDAQ 100. Now, the reason I, I had mentioned earlier um, that we were, I was more bearish that the tech sector, or not as bearish, but I was looking for sector rotational play, money coming off the table in technology names and going to use somewhere else. Um, looking at this, this is a trend tool of volume using the on balance volume indicator. And what we saw, if I can line this up for you, just to share with you this tool. So here the market's making a new high close back on uh, October 29th. The next day we had a major turn. It really didn't close significantly lower in price, but we saw a significant downturn in the amount of stocks that, and look at the volume. On balance volume was giving us, as you can see here, we had rise in price, but a decline on that rise in price with volume. So we had bearish divergence. And so if the market's going to, if any sector is going to go down, it's possibly going to be uh, the NASDAQ. Now, we, I, I personally waited, and today I took off half my uh, debit uh, put spreads in the 8381s, uh, the December Qs, uh, based on the fact that we're coming close to support, number one. Number two, I'm going to be leaving for out of town uh, Tuesday. I'm going to Germany. I'm doing a live trading event and speaking at the uh, Traders World Conference. If uh, we have anyone uh, in Europe, it uh, might be in Frankfurt next week. Uh, if you've been there before, it's at the Mesa, the uh, big, uh, it's kind of like their, I guess, McCormick Center for Germany. It's huge, huge conference, huge conference. So, um, you know, not being around trading, uh, you know, different hours, I'll try to do what I can, but we are traveling. But I think at this point in time, we we'll come down to a little bit of uh, uh, of movement here, and it makes sense, as I said, execution takes something off the table. you got to do it. Um, I think that the way the market is trading in here, uh, I'm not as bearish as the uh, sell signal and the low close doji would have me uh, be at this juncture. Let's take a look at the Russell real quick. All right, so looking at the Russell, uh, what we're looking at is the IWM, person's pivots, my buy and sell signals. Many of you know about those. Then we have the advanced decline. Now, I'm, I'm listing advanced decline uh, comparative ratio lines on each respective index. So many of you might only look at the advanced decline on the NYSE. If you've noticed that I've taken a look at the advanced decline and created these lines for uh, each respective index. So if you're trading the index, and these are all capitalized weighted indexes, it makes sense to, to take a look at the health of each individual index. If price is going up and it's not, if it's going up and it's not associated with a rise in the majority of stocks with that move in price, then y you know it's not a, as healthy of a rally. If the market rallies and we see uh, breakout moves to the upside, um, and all of a sudden that price move uh, to the upside is not associated with uh, an increase in the advanced decline it, it is a cause for worry. And we had for several days, four days in a row, um, where it just flatlined. And then finally, uh, we had a low close doji over a week and a half ago. And guess what? We saw a, a downturn in this marketplace. Now, here's a funny thing. And this is why I like to look at the on balance volume indicator versus looking at volume bars. Okay. So while granted, if you get this buy signal at the beginning uh, of our middle of October, right? So we get this big buy signal as breakout. We saw a huge move to the upside in the advanced decline, a huge move up on volume. Look at your volume histogram bars. It gave an entirely different picture of saying, no, nah, this isn't a really strong rally. But yet this thing was good from, a, a, you know, for a, about a two week, three week move to the upside. Um, and, and I think it gave a false sense of security in, in the uh, using volume histogram bar. So, I, I mean, here's an, just an, a great example of why I don't, I teach it's better to use, if you're looking at a, a, the condition of the trend of the market, to use on balance volume. Looking at volume histogram bars helps to identify individual days of volumes. And I think it's more important to, to look at the, the, the trend of the market. 
if the market is going down, right, then we ought to see a decline in on balance volume because as it, it, it just tallies the, the um, volume trend of the market on up days versus down days. So in using um, technical analysis, there are specific tools that relate to each respective market. When we're trading with uh, stock indices, it's important to look at uh, we have access to these advanced decline uh, levels. It is important, and I think uh, the volume is, is the lifeblood of the market. Anyone will tell you that, um, and many of you already know that. But here's the funny thing. Volume histogram bars, I think why they've become in uh, the last, I think now we've got to say decade, the reason why they've become less effective, in it, and every time I do a seminar, Overton uh, in Toronto, I ask the audience, how many people, I don't know if you were at that particular presentation, but I asked the people in Toronto, I said, how many people um, are struggle with volume? They see a market go up and it's on light volume. They use the volume histogram bars and they sit there and they go, wow, this market's not going to go any higher. I'm going to get short here. And it just continues to move up. And yet there is those volume histogram bars that just say, oh, it's a light, light rally. And yet they get burnt. And a majority of people raised their hands and said, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's like they don't understand the old school teaching used to tell us that, uh, you know, volume increase with price increase is bullish. And, and so, therefore, people were confu are getting confused. And I think here's why volume histogram bars aren't working at, like they did 40, 30, 20 years ago is because we have so many different uh, ways to trade the market. There's ETFs. There's also options. And so I think we take away from that volume uh, in the market. And so it, the on-balance volume indicator, it doesn't lie. It gives us the uh, tally on the trend of the market, the strength on up days versus down days. And you can see if the market's making a high in price, is it getting higher readings in price and are we getting higher readings in volume? And if so, then you know that there's more upside in the market and you've got to watch for sell signals. Okay? So that's looking at the Russell. Let's take a look at the NYSE. Now this is, this is one that I think everybody and every trading platform has access to the advanced decline. This is the most famous one. This is the one that's uh, more typical that everyone gets to look at. And of course, we did generate a sell signal uh, last week on a daily chart on the NYSE. And we have seen a decline in the, uh, as you can tell, the advanced decline moved significantly lower. So we might see some, some downside pressure in this sector. And remember, not all sectors are equal right now. Let's take a look at the diamonds. Because in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, I mean, this is one that's been just one major perplexing situation. It hasn't made aggressive newer highs this year. It has not, uh, without a doubt. Looking at the advanced decline, it hasn't joined the little rally. There's divergence there. And then looking at on balance volume, the rally, I don't care how you slice it. it there's just not been any volume associated with it. The, the only thing it had going for it is that we've got these almost every single index at the beginning uh, or the middle of last month hit right at the monthly person's pivot. We had that big, huge upturn, and they all moved up in, in, in concert together. But the NASDAQ and the Russell outperformed all the other sectors. So now, where do we go from here? Where should we be looking at? What, what I think, personally, when we take a look at the longer term, and this is what's exciting about doing this presentation tonight, because it, it is November, and um, it is the end of the week. We've got the unemployment report out tomorrow. It's going to be very important. So, you know, the question begs. If it's a light number under 130,000, gain back on. The Fed's not going to taper, and it's quantitative easing for at least uh, through uh, the end of the first quarter of next year at least. All right? Um, when we take a look at the technical aspect of the market, and that's what I wanted to show you, it, when we look at this, histogram bar, it's kind of hard to really gain any insight, you know, as you see little uptrends, little downtrends, you know, this, this little thing here. But when we take a look at the on-balance volume, uh, we see a rise in trend in the market. We haven't seen any uh, notable um, 
declines in the market from a week over week basis. But I do have I have one thing, folks, that uh, is pretty much a cause for concern. We formed a doji last week, all right, in the market. So what was last week's low in the S and P's? It was 1747. So if we close below last week's low, we will get the official uh, my proprietary uh, low close doji formation. If we close below last week's low, number one, and if you get the advanced decline composite comparative ratio line, uh, if we form a break underneath the weekly moving average that I have here, you get that crossover, then I can say, guess what? I think we got a more meaningful correction in the market. Um, but again, dojis do not indicate a downturn, they're not negative, they, they indicate a pause in the market. So in of it by itself, the E-mini S&P does not generate a sell signal and say it's the crash of the new millennium. But looking at the NASDAQ 100, I think this, uh, this particular sector has had such a, an amazingly strong run. And it's had an amazingly strong run with the advanced decline, and it's also had an amazingly strong run on some serious volume. So it's going to take more than just one week. And notice that we are coming right to this moving average. That's why today in the trading room I said, you know, it makes sense. I got support down here. What kind of support do I have? I had weekly moving average support. So that's why it made sense to execution. Remember, cover half your position. So if this market continues to move lower, uh, then I feel that, you know, the next major support area is going to first be these old highs. So you may want to, uh, I'm going to give you a couple levels here. And what we want to watch for, number one, is do we close below not just last week's low, but the prior week's low. Two weeks lows in a row. We close below that level, which is approximately, as you can see here, 33.22. Let's just round down and say 33.20. Close below there, easily we've got uh, another 100 points to the downside uh, in the NASDAQ. Is it, uh, is it cause for um, a major... Uh, shorting opportunity, or should we be looking for some buying opportunities? Well, let's go over here, and let's share it with something here. And I'm going to come right down here, and I'm going to do some. Actually, I'm going to show you that later. I was going to show you a, um, and I, I'll get to that in the next couple slides here. Um, the seasonal aspect. Actually, the Nasdaq weakens through mid-November and then strengthens again from the end of uh, approximately the third week of November going into December. So the answer is, um, actually, we're looking for a pullback in the NASDAQ, and then we want, on that pullback, you want to be starting to look for some buying opportunities in that sector. And the key here is if we do get a little sell-off and we don't have an, a, a complete meltdown in the advanced decline, and if it doesn't come on heavy volume as measured with on-balance volume, then to me it's more of a buying opportunity on the pullback rather than sell every rally that comes down the pike. There's a big difference there, okay? That's the key. Now, looking at the Russell. Now, the Russell was a little overheated, a little overextended. We got, now we are in its second week sell signal. Now, think of it this way. If you looked at just this chart, you'd say, wow, look at that. We got a low close doji last week, follow through this week. We've had a nice little sell-off in the market. So if that's the case, answer me this. Why aren't we trading at significantly lower levels? And why didn't this sell-off come on a little heavier volume? So the point is that this could be a very short-lived sell-off in the Russell. Tomorrow, Friday, will be an important tell, uh, especially as we have a major catalyst that can turn things one way or another and that's the unemployment report. So to follow up here, looking with the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, I mean, volume trend is still intact. The advanced decline lines are still intact. You know, we might see a little, we're right at weekly support. And, um, you know, I, I think the market here is, is still presenting itself. We don't have any of these orange sell signals, which, by the way, only generated, uh, you know, at best, once we got a sell signal 
Look at all the sell signals this year. We've gotten three weeks sell-off, no sell-off, three weeks sell-off, no sell-off. Maybe we get a sell-off, but we don't even have a sell signal here. So um, I can't tell you that now's the time to really, you know, get out of the market. I don't see that. I think I'm seeing more uh, of stagnating market um, rather than the big kahuna sell-off. We don't have evidence yet of the big kahuna sell-off. So that's one of the messages in tonight's presentation that I definitely want to, to share with you. Um, in addition to that, I also want to share with you one other uh, tool that we have at our disposal. I think you might find this um, to be important. On this page, this is a relationship or a, what we call a relative strength spread chart, relative strength comparative analysis. And what I have here is the, as you can see, at the upper left corner. Now, this is a little advanced. And so for some of you guys, and ladies and gentlemen, this is technical analysis. This is not 101 with any stretch of the imagination. But we, we have what we're looking at is kind of like this uh, kind of channeling effect. And uh, more importantly, I want you to pay attention to when uh, the market has crossed, when the black line has crossed below this little blue line. So let's just take a look and see what's happened in the market when that occurred. All right. So I don't know if I'm lining it up correctly, but let's just take kind of a look, see here when and, and share with you what had happened. And we're going to talk about this relationship right now. Okay. All right. So when the S and P's and that's the spider versus the Q's, which is the NASDAQ 100, when the S and P benchmark 500, outperforms the cues, the black line goes up. Okay? Bullish times, good times to be had for all. That's what that represents. Okay? So when the market, the, as measured by the S&P 500, when it goes down, then the black line goes down, and that's not good times for all. All right? And so as you can see, um, the chart underneath, red is the cue, black is the spiders. So when we get a crossover of the moving average, look what happens. We get a market that moves lower. We get the crossover at the moving average, the market moves lower. We get a crossover of the moving average, and the market moves lower. Does everyone see that? All right. So has the market crossed over? Do we have a crossover here? No. No, we don't. Interesting. All right, so I can't really throw the baby in the bathwater out the window quite yet, can I? No. And here's another thing. This is another tool. This is Sherman McClellan, the McClellan Oscillator. Kind of helps to indicate uh, levels when the market gets to be at overbought stages. It's not 100% perfect, but it gives us warning. And then when the market has these readings, uh, as you can see, we get to oversold levels. Okay, so here's a funny thing. So here's the here's the oversold levels uh, in the market. All right, here are the oversold levels. The market hasn't even gone down, and look where we're at right now. <laughs> I mean, if. Uh, I'm I'm kind of hoping maybe you get a, a one or two day downturn, you know, maybe a little bit more uncertainty tomorrow, maybe into next week. And uh, if we get a reading anywhere near this level and uh, we still don't get a crossover to the downside, folks, that's uh, more bullish than, than, you know, and, and I think what we need to do is focus in on buying opportunities and start looking at s selective stocks going forward. Okay, does uh, so this is kind of some uh, again, it's 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 fairly advanced stuff, but I wanted to share with you. You could see for yourself and then some other things that we want to talk about here real quickly is where are we year to date and, and what does all this colored stuff represent? What does this junk mean? Well, what this means is it's all color coded. The IIX is the Internet Technology uh, Index 
We've got IYT in red, which means transportation. KRE is regional banks. The S&P 500 is the thin black. We've got XLB materials, XLE energy, XLF very light blue is the financials. And the financials XLF is a lesson for you guys and girls. XLF is not a financial bank index. It is a diversified financial index. It's got the CME, which is a commodity exchange in it. It's got Metropolitan Life, which is an insurer. It's got American Express, which is a credit card company. So it's not a pure bank play. Next, we have uh, technology, XLK, XLP, consumer staple. The watermelon is uh, utilities. Uh, and then we have, of course, V for uh, healthcare, Y, uh, XLY is consumer discretionary. And then I threw in EEM because um, in, when I was in Germany in September speaking to some institutional um, folks, they were all talking about how they were invested in emerging markets and what did my research share with them, uh, what, did, what, did, what did my stuff say. And I, what I said was, I hope you have really good, I was kind of, I wasn't cocky, but they were kind of, a couple of the guys were, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, I had to explain to them that I hope they had really good customers because by the time their customers figured out, now, now keep in mind, this was in uh, September, so it was right around here where the market was down around 10, 11 percent. And at the time, uh, the S&Ps were up about 15 uh, percent. So I said, gee, if your clients are that good and they figure out that they've, uh, they're down 10 percent on their investment with you and uh, they missed out a lost opportunity of a positive 15 percent in the S&Ps, when they figure out that they've lost 25 percent trading with you, boy, that's not too smart. Um, but the moral of the story is it's important to say, you know, when someone says, I think emerging markets is a good play, um, you have to say, really, I'm, I'll tell you what, year over year, and this is a, a percentage change chart for year over year at the beginning of the year. Here's where I start to look at emerging markets. So I want you to pay attention to this because right now we're, we're back. We tried to rally. We tried to rally. Um, you see this blue line? This blue line represents 0%. Until the emerging markets, until the EEM starts going positive, money is not going to go back into this market. All right? So you want to look at the year-over-year -year performance on emerging markets. Other than that, it's dead money right now. Okay? So what sectors are still popular? Well, when I look at um, the market currently, the worst performing sector is utility. And even with today's action, I would have expected to see utilities up a little bit, and I didn't. So until I get some crossovers in the marketplace, and until I start to see maybe uh, the utilities outperform, uh, and, and I start to see some of these other sectors underperform, and you get kind of like a crossover like this, okay? So follow this green line here, right? Follow the green line. I'm kind of presenting. See the green line here? This is the regional banks. The regional banks blew off to the upside July, June 19th. June 19th, right there, that's when Ben Bernanke said, free money for all, and the regional banks exploded. Okay? And, and so right now, look where regional banks are. If Ben Bernanke, uh, if he giveth the free money, if Ben Bernanke taketh the free money, then the regional banks are going to decline. So what I'm sharing with you is looking at relative strength performances, the top dogs in, this, in the space are still top dogs, even with today's price action. So we're not far off our highs for the year on these sectors, and, and that's why I have to say, gee, I'm starting to chalk up more evidence that says this is not the correction uh, or the top or a, a market uh, that, that's getting ready to crash and burn like 2007. It doesn't have that systematic signal to it, all right? So if it does, then, I mean, obviously, I, I hope you guys probably realize it makes sense. If the regional banks went up because Ben Bernanke was going to still be back there embracing with open arms with printing $85 billion and buying $85 billion in, in treasury bonds per month, 
and that caused that sector to, to, to surge. If he's going to take it away, then that sector is going to go down. So that would be uh, looking at the KRE is one telltale sign. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, this is the same information except for this just looks at it from the beginning of October. So what have we done in just the last few weeks? Well, you know, if you look at things in a different time frame, a lot of people are saying, hey, look, uh, emerging market is getting, it, it, it's, it's moving up. It's, it's got a great performance. Well, notice that on a year-over-year -year basis, it didn't get positive on the year. So therefore, you don't want to be chasing that market. And now it's back, and look what it's done in just six weeks. In just six weeks, it's gone from approximately 5% to almost negative 1%. So it's lost 6% in just, um, you know, make it less than two weeks, all right? So look at the strength of the market right now. Um, we still have Internet, IIX, uh, even though we had a little bit of correction in here, transportation, this segment of the market is still strong. The one that's kind of funny, um, you know, that, that we're starting to see uh, strength is that, remember, over the last couple weeks, since 1021, Internet technology has been going down right? Internet technology has been going down. And so now everything else is coming and coming down and it's starting to pop up. So if we start to kind of get back up to these levels here, um, you know, and so what did I just say a few moments ago when I showed you the, uh, the, the, the NASDAQ 100? It's at support. And if it's a small correction, guess what? This whole sector, the IIX, which contains Google, uh, Akamai Technology, uh, Netgear, and a whole slew of other names, um, you know, they might be, if they've gotten whacked hard enough, may present some strong buying opportunities going into year's end because, after all, seasonally speaking, that stuff still remains fairly strong going into year's end. Okay? So what I wanted to say is that, let me go over here. And I want to save because I don't want to delete any of my work. So, so far, how do you guys like what you're seeing? Good. Okay, great. All right, so now let's take a look at... Um, All right, so like I was talking about, here's the IIX, all right? So we look at the, the components in the IIX. And uh, we had this little uh, from October, then you get this from November 8th, you get this little uh, correction in the market, and then we resume the uptrend going into the end of the year. So I've got my eye on, even though we've had an amazing run in 2012, obviously the world is based on Internet. So we want to kind of focus in still on the, on the Internet, uh, space and I, so I would have to say technology while it has corrected these are going to be some some uh, areas of interest in the market um, we also wanted to take a quick look at um, some other areas that I think you guys will have an interest in that's number one crude oil and crude oil um, as I promised crude oil has had an, an, an you know, an amazing decline in the market. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we just, in a very short period of time, what went up, it came straight back down. So let me go over here and get all the data up for us. All right, a couple of things that I'm looking at. Solid downturn. Obviously, as you can see, uh, you know, I'm already watching crude oil. Funny thing is, is look at today's price action. This is a weekly chart that I've got in front of you. Look at what we have. It's a doji against pivot support. This is my, it's not monthly. That's my quarterly pivot support. So we're at quarterly pivot support forming dojis on a weekly basis chart. So that's to me, it says, gee, is this market getting ready for another wave to the downside? I thought that easily we would have been able to see perhaps $90. Uh, and maybe this is just close enough for right now. So crude oil, one of the uh, interesting aspects is, as you can see, um, coming into the end of this month, going into the first week of December, 
uh, crude oil actually has a little bottoming action. We're weeks away. So if we went from a strong trend and we consolidate chop around, because typically that's what markets do. They go into a, a, a trend mode and then they go into a consolidation basing action period. So with the doji, we want to watch this week to see if, if you guys aren't following longer term charts, make sure that you pay attention to those weekly charts because it's kind of ironic that we've got a, a doji at pivots. And it, you know, uh, about 10 years ago, and it's been about 10 years ago, that I wrote this book that really popularized and a lot of educators and a lot of people copied uh, my work and enjoy it. I was the first one in the world to come up with the uh, analysis of looking at candlesticks with pivot point analysis. And I know a lot of people use pivots, but um, not many people did at the time. When that book first came out and, and it was titled uh, Candlestick and Pivot Point Trading Triggers, one of the analogies that I had is looking at uh, especially we did a back test study on what the frequency of dojis, hammers, shooting stars, and dojis at tops and bottoms were. So in any event, um, when I see a crude oil market that's coming into a seasonally uh, strong period of time and we form dojis, I got to raise the red flag and the caution here. So if we do break down, perhaps we come back if we form a doji tomorrow. This is Friday. Tomorrow's the last day of the week. If we do form a doji or if we do form uh, maybe a little hammer, I don't know where it's going to close tomorrow. I'm not that good. Um, but I could say if over the next couple days we don't take out this low, then I think there's a whole lot of, of potential. Uh, there might be a little bit of upside, but I think at the very least we should see expect a consolidation for the next couple weeks. Be aware of the fact that we should see an increase in price because we come in, we're entering into a seasonally strong period of time on crude oil. So that would mean also, guess what that would mean? On this correction, on this correction, right? If crude oil goes down, then what do we see in some of the names, especially uh, looking at the XLE? So for you stock traders, we want to do a top-down approach, right? So looking at, um, for example, XLE, if you're not interested in trading crude oil futures, looking at the XLE, what a coincidence. Uh, this market had this little strong uptrend. It's been in a sideways action. The XLE is coming down a little bit. Hopefully, hopefully you get a little bit more choppiness in here, right? Um, but we start to enter, as we get into the, the third week of November, a seasonally strong period of time. So we would probably want to be looking at, I don't know, you know, uh, the oil service sector, which is the OIH. Stocks like uh, a Halliburton uh, might not be, um, you know, your, your play. So I just wanted to make sure that we saw the difference between the energy components that relate to, like, the refiners, the producers, the oil explorers. Um, watch for that sector to go up. So on this overall correction in the market, I just wanted to present you with testifiable solid evidence based on the, some technical tools that many of you might not have known that exist. Because a lot of people are just using MACD, stochastics, Bollinger Bands, and maybe some moving averages. But they don't use some of the advanced uh, technical tools that we've, we, we shared with you today. All right. So I think that's one of the things that it might be important to uh, figure out going forward. If we have... Um, like a CVX, a Chevron. Notice where Chevron, now this is where it starts getting interesting for me, is because Chevron has not been in an uptrend. Chevron actually is going to form a little green arrow with, on a weekly chart, which means we are at quarterly support in the market. That's not a short-term support. And um, the market is now, if you notice here with Chevron, it's been in a slight downtrend. It's been in, in a downtrend in accordance to its seasonality, and it's now going to start to enter a seasonally strong period of time. So Chevron has these long shadows in here. This is a stock and a sector I certainly would not want to be uh, shorting right now. I'd want to see, do we generate a weekly buy signal? This will probably be, for you guys that are in our planning and scanning on Monday, this is going to be a name that we're going to be <laughs> focusing in on or one of the names that we'll be focusing in on. Because if we can get some more, and, and it's not just one name, 
but if I can get some more stocks that have the same similar makeup, I mean, this is Occidental Petroleum. It has a little bit different uh, seasonality to it, but uh, it moves going into December. Uh, so I'm going to start looking for some names in this space that I think can give us um, at least, and unfortunately, this is Exxon, so hopefully we get a little bit of a pullback over the next couple of days, but boy, that just had a really sharp, strong move on volume, and hopefully we can get a pullback into this market, uh, maybe uh, if we're lucky to around the mid-89 area as we get into that seasonally strong period of time. So the energy sector, crude oil, the technology space, I'm thinking that we definitely have some commodities here that can present some uh, decent opportunities. I know that uh, many of you are probably not trading uh, copper. Uh, after all, the volume tells me so because no one trades copper anymore. But copper begins a seasonally strong period of time. This is a lot of stuff that we did with the Commodity Traders Almanac. Um, notice that it's been scraping against its pivots. It's kind of coiling. Uh, you guys may recognize uh, this kind of pattern in here. Now, what I would be playing with copper, by the way, and copper is a harbinger, an indicator of economic conditions, all right? So for copper, uh, since it, it's, it's way too early to be buying copper, it sits towards the end of November, early December, right? But what I want to be focusing in on copper is if we uh, get a, one thing that we need to see is volume. You've got to get an, a, a move to the upside in price, and you've got to get a move associated with volume. So what I want to be looking at for copper, A, is I want to see a breakout at least above in time this last swing high. Now, there's a, a way to play copper, BHP Billiton. All right, and take a look at that. It's already starting to move up. Look at this monthly buy signal. So hopefully if we get a pullback on BHP, so if the stock market goes down and hopefully it can drag some strong names down with it a bit, all right? So we'd be looking at 66.92. 66.92 is almost my, uh, this area right in here. So hopefully you get a pullback in BHP at 66, I don't know, call it 67 bucks, right? So if you get a pullback at $67, what does that look like on the charts here real quick? So just imagine, that's called anticipating market needs. Remember, we went over that on the first chart. Um, so that, to me, as we enter a seasonally strong period of time, here's some names and some ways that we could play the market. And I know this isn't your, your LinkedIn, and I know a lot of people are like, well, show me what's going on with Twitter and show me what's going on with all these other names. Um, you'd be surprised that, um, folks, while everyone's looking at the uh, the big velocity movers, your LinkedIn, um, you know, LinkedIn for me, uh, this little decline, I mean, you know, it's probably got another twenty dollars downside to it. Um, you know, that was a pretty strong liquidation in LinkedIn, by the way. And uh, if you notice here, here we go. Um, Volume is associated with that, that market. So when I say $20, I mean, you, you probably, you know, because the markets move a little bit more than we think. Old highs broke out should bring us back to support. So maybe we get, you know, one day just right near the 188 area. Um, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me, probably shouldn't surprise you. There's a big liquidation there. Uh, so long and the short of it is, I think I'm looking for stocks that, uh, have sound fundamentals uh, to them. They've been around for a while, and uh, I'm looking at the overall market to make my determination, do I want to buy stock on a pullback? And the answer there is yes, I do still. All right? Tomorrow's an important day. we got to go through and watch, um, you know, how we react to this market. So, um, you know, besides BHP, uh, you know, Andrew said, of course, FCX, which has also a, a gold um, component to it, you have seasonality strength coming into copper. You got seasonality strength coming into crude oil. Crude oil's been down. It's kind of hard. I think you guys, if you understand candlestick analysis, you understand, gee, it's kind of ironic that we're just forming after this big week we've had in trading where copper is forming, or, or excuse me, crude oil is forming a doji. Hopefully that is uh, kind of a, uh, an interesting play. And, you know, 
I'll give you one more. It's in the ag complex, and this one is, um, I know, probably one that many, many traders have no interest in trading corn futures, that's for sure. But I think that we have a good shot at corn, and I'm hoping to see, uh, you know, a little bit more of a sizable move to the downside to this green level right here. And then I'll be looking at the long side of the March contract, not December. This liquidation still has a little bit more to go. I think it's probably uh, very conceivable that we can get into this area right there against those lows, and that is what that represents. Notice that the seasonality of the market, we come into what's called the harvest lows. So we want to be focusing on that. I'm not looking at the monthly support. I'm looking at longer-term quarterly support against these old lows here. So if you're interested in corn, what, a, a course, goes with corn, of course, uh, from a seasonal perspective, watch this. Notice that John Deere. Now, John Deere is one of those stocks that no one likes to own. We've had a uh, kind of a meltdown in the marketplace, right? And um, this year, it's also one of those stocks that, if we kind of take our our uh, take a look at this this uh, together, you know, you'll see where were we uh, at the beginning of the year. All right, so. Where were we at the beginning of the year? Let's take a look at this together if you're interested. Um, so the market started, it closed on 1228, John Deere, right there. So let me get rid of this line, delete it. Let me uh, edit this line. I want to put this up, make it real thick, all right? Let me get rid of this. So this is the kind of stuff that, let's say, you went long, John Deere, you're a fund manager, you're, you've managed money, and you went long this company um, anywhere from the beginning of the year, okay? So from the beginning of the year, you went long John Deere, and you've been holding this stock for the majority of the year. All right, what side of the fence are you on on, on the profit loss target? You're obviously on the loss. So let me ask this question. At the beginning of the presentation, I said, we want to take a look at names that are not near their 52-week highs, which would be up here. We want to look at names that are within 10% of their 52-week lows, which is here. So um, let, me, let me ask you a question. Is that about 10% of the 52-week lows? I mean, it's real. I mean, you don't have to be concise about it, but I mean, if the low is uh, 79 and the stock is trading at 81, 10% is eight bucks. Uh, sure, absolutely. So John Deere, interestingly enough, has a seasonal tendency of going up. So this year, if it doesn't really do anything, it might give us that real seasonal pop. So it, the lower it falls, it going into year's end. John Deere is going to be one of those names that uh, we'll be putting on our shopping list of first quarter uh, trades that we might see a healthy move in. So I'm sure there's 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 a hundred different ways to skin a cat. There's all kinds of different ways that we can look for trading opportunities in the marketplace. Um, you know, this is just some, and uh, I'm sure if, if you guys have. You know, a lot of you made comments and posted that this year was kind of tough for trading. Um, you know, and if you're if you are having a a tough go of it trading certain stocks, you know, we do uh, uh, come visit us at Planning and Scanning on every Mondays here. I think we open that up to the room if you'd like uh, to find out information about that. If you want to find out more information, we have an amazing uh, product. Uh, I'm very proud of it. It's called PA Stock Alerts. And uh, Tom and I uh, work with PA Stock together. And PA Stock Alerts, just to let you know, we are offering a very, I mean, it's insanely incredible offer. But for 12 months, comes out to $50 to, for, for 12 months, a whole year, $5.99. Um, you can absolutely, we're throwing, giving in a special bonus with my Stock Trading Simplified course. We do three videos a week, Tuesday, Thursday, Sundays, religiously, actionable email alerts. And uh, here's what we've done so far this year, and here's a, a whole list of, 
of all the stocks that we've done uh, so far this year it's uh, with actionable trades 70.9 percent now this is real trading and I, I want you guys to know something all right I know there's a lot of emails that people say they have great this and they have great that and they have a, a thousand trades in a row without losers now listen we don't have we have losers I'm here to tell you all right so uh, let me let me just point this out to you all right if you went through the list these are our names I mean we came up with some scans that some of you might remember um, you know we were kind of bullish and looking at regional banks so for B BB and T and STI but here is a name that popped up on our radar screen before it was even in the news panel uh, another one that we just had which was pretty healthy was low alarm with the electronic cigarettes we're talking about and we're not prone to going short the market we've given it a stab we use TZA as you can see which is an inverse leveraged ETF um, so you can take a look at a, a lot of the stock picks in there we send email alerts before this happens so we do the videos we talk about what we're looking at uh, again PA stock alerts it includes the three video reports every Sunday Tuesdays and Thursday night we do our sector and stock analysis and of course we have our actionable email alerts so um, if you take a look at this I mean I, I find it hard to, to, to find most mutual funds up 20 percent we don't have a uh, um, a management there's no management fee it's not like an, uh, we're, we're managing money uh, you can take the trades you don't have to but I want to just give you the overall performance is a positive 70 percent but it didn't come without some losers but so far out of 43 it's almost a trade a week 43 stock picks 28 winners 15 losers it's a 65 percent win track record 65 percent win track record so I'm pretty proud of this and this is just this year so obviously you know we do something right in the market if you're interested you want to learn more about this take advantage of this it's 12.99 and the course we originally offered that stock trading simplified for eight hundred and ninety nine dollars so we're offering this for you guys if I'm very proud of this this is an exciting opportunity for 599 for the whole year 12 months that's fifty dollars a month that's twelve dollars and fifty cents a week um, click there sign up if you're interested, take advantage of this immediately. Uh, this will, this offer is going to expire uh, Sunday night. It'll, so if you click here, that's where to get it. Uh, you can go through, and I'll put the uh, link into here if you'd like. Uh, find out more about it. There's the link. Save it into your browser. Uh, I wanted to say I hope you found an interest in what uh, tonight's presentation had to offer for you guys. Um, the the amount of work that I think it requires to trade successfully in the market, I don't think it's as much work as everyone makes it out to be. I think what the real key is is to do to work smart rather than hard, and to have the discipline as we talked about in 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 the beginning of the presentation. Those are some very neat qualities having the right trading ideas the right technical tools and forming that opinion based on facts and and market measures after all everything that we talked about tonight looking at seasonality I think it's important to say okay I'm looking at seasonality but that doesn't mean this year it's gonna happen I need to kinda of monitor the condition of the market I need to kinda of look at where we are with respect to where the, it a market is compared to other markets so relative strength these are the tools that we like to look at uh, comparative relative strength and the funny thing is is a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about in tonight's presentation by the way was all in um, my original book as I showed you right here this book came out mastery in the stock market this was voted the best investment book of 2013 I'm very proud of it and we talked about seasonality talked about uh, the tools that I've mentioned tonight so in any event I hope you guys uh, have a great rest of the year I think we are excited about the volatility that's kind of going in the market and speaking of volatility is anyone if you noticed with today's big sell-off how we didn't the VIX didn't even get a pop over 15 um, so I think they're you know the market there's still a lot of value and a, a lot of buying opportunity out there there's a lot of stocks that haven't performed there are a lot of stocks by the way 
that are under um, uh, traders' radar screens. They're just not there. And one of the reasons is because everyone's focused on the big momentum names, the Teslas, the LinkedIn, the Googles, the price lines. And those are, those are action trades. But you know what? I think people that have been in those action trades and playing earnings, um, you know, they've missed a lot of uh, different opportunities in the market. Slow, steady gains, uh, it really makes it a nice way to conclude the month the end, more importantly, a quarter, and then finally the year. So anyway, thank you all for joining us. That's all the time we have tonight. I did go a few minutes over, but I wanted to give you guys, because I think that this is such an important time of our trading history with what's been going on in Washington, D.C., the fight between Capitol Hill and the White House. Um, you know, <laughs> sequestration, these are, these are terms that growing up, none of us ever heard of and yet it impacts our lives um, and and I think that you know the markets there's a lot of you that have spent a lot of time a lot of research a lot of you folks I know you guys I know a lot of you people I mean by by face and I can tell you this I want to say thank you for coming in here I try to deliver good at information and phenomenal uh, offer I mean if you, if you're interested do take us up on on that. That that was a, that is a great offer for you guys. Um, but I think for the markets and for a lot of you guys that have put time and energy and education in the markets and have struggled, I, you know. And I hear a lot of this. I hear a lot of this. A lot of people saying, "Yeah, I heard this. I've been listening to that, and I'm confused." And I and I think that's, you know, it's tough to be disciplined to stay the course when you get too much excess information. Um, if you listen to the news this year, you'd probably be selling the stock market all the way up and you would be missing all kinds of great trading ideas. And if you listen to the news, you'd be probably buying Tesla all the way up and then getting burned, uh, no pun intended. But in um, any event, there are, are some opportunities out there. And um, you know, I hope uh, we see you uh, in our, our past cross. If you're not going to be in Germany, then perhaps at the Las Vegas Traders Expo. And I look forward. I know a lot of you guys will be there. So uh, thank you all very much. Gary, thank you. Uh, love her stuff. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, you guys have a great evening. We'll see what happens with the unenjoyment report tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> I plan, Ruth, thank you so much, Ruth. Um, I do plan to have a safe trip to Germany. And we'll be back uh, the following week. We'll be running the show from over there in Germany. Bill Mack, thank you, my friend. It was nice to see you in Toronto as well. Um, everybody, you be good. Thank you all very much. This was recorded, so we'll send this out if you wanted to go through this again. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, this, this chart here, to me, speaks, uh, you know, big volumes. Uh, if you think of a big name like John Deere, negative on the year, right? Who would have thought? This whole time, who would have thought, right? So uh, anyway, guys, have a great evening. Thank you all very much.